So what I want to talk about is think about um, the, the, what philosophers would call the epistemology of, of Christian faith. That is, uh, what, are, what are the sources of rational justification for our faith? How is it that someone enters into the Christian faith? And is that a, can that be a reason-guided kind of process? And then broadening out, thinking about the Christian community, right? And how is it that the Christian community, this changing thing over time, uh, understands, responds to evidence, uh, and uh, many people sort of look at it and they say it's a bit of a mess of a process by comparison with the sciences, right, which look like a really rigorous communal project for seeking knowledge. Um, uh, how, sh how should we think about the rationality of Christian faith? Okay, so, um, you know, if you think about an individual who comes to Christian faith as an adult, kind of, kind of orient yourself that way, as I myself did uh, at the end of my freshman year at, uh, at a university, um, it, it happens within some specific local right, community. You, 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 you come to faith within a community that is itself embedded within one of the, the several broad Christian theological traditions. Uh, now this fact of dependency on a community is not by itself objectionable. The fact that my, a lot of what I think when I join the Christian community is based on what other people have known and discerned and come to believe. I don't figure all this out for myself from scratch. I could not possibly do that. The historical bases for Christianity and thinking about the relationship of science and Christianity and all that, right? It's, it's characteristic of human belief formings that both informal, that, that are coming to believe things informally, uh, and the more system, systematized practices that we have in the sciences, that it's mediated through communities, right? We don't, none of us are lone ranger, uh, you know, knowledge seekers. We, 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 we're embedded within communities. We rely on individuals and whole social communities for knowledge of particular matters of fact, and for the, the justification we have for interpreting the world uh, around us in the way that we do. And I think if you, you, know, if you stop to think about it, um, uh, I, I think it, it, um, it, it can't be emphasized too much that 99 point something percent of what, everything you believe, uh, and it doesn't matter how smart you are, how much you know about science or whatever, uh, is based on the testimony of other people. That's just the way it is. It's the way it is in science. It's the way it is in everyday life. We receive information, right? We contribute a small bit to the flood of uh, sources of information uh, that, that the, the human community has, and we communicate that to, to one another, right? It starts as young children when we're just being told a bunch of stuff, and it continues on in everyday life. Everything you think you know about history, right, the geography of the planet and science and so forth, it's all stuff you've heard. Even if you're a scientist, even if you're a historian, right, you've only contributed, you've only done direct research of a very small bit, a sliver that's part of this massive communal project, and you trust other scholars, right? Uh, but of course, we may rationally, we, we can be rationally criticized for the choices we make regarding which individuals, which communities that we depend on for knowledge about the world. Uh, and how we appropriate, you might say, the, the products that they hand to us, the knowledge products. A virtuous thinker, if we want to be intellectually virtuous thinkers, uh, we, we need to balance a certain kind of caution, a certain sort of appropriate skepticism with, uh, and critical reflection with courage, right? And we have to balance curiosity with hum our humility and, and, and love the truth. Right? So, and here's where the trouble many people see for religious belief comes in. Um, they'll direct our att attention to the history of changing and conflicted theological belief and practice within the, for Christianity, running all the way from ancient Israel through its Christian development or offshoot right up to the present day. And they ask us to consider that that history from stemming from ancient Israel through the church right up to our present times within a wider context of the panoply of religions uh, in human religious history uh, and to give attention to what we know about some of the natural and social sources of early religious beliefs and practices in human history and the ways they were often intertwined with pre-scientific explanations of natural phenomena, right? Religious uh, explanations way back in human history. 
And so as these people, these kind of religious outsiders, skeptics see it, the communal processes of religious belief formation and development look less than stellar, rationally speaking. Uh, and that seems a fair conclusion. Right, that the, the processes, it hasn't all been, you know, the kind of most rigorous rational methods for how human beings have developed, cultivated religious beliefs about the world. Especially when we judge them, as is nowadays inevitable, against the backdrop of the impressive communal processes taking place in this building, you know, and elsewhere within the mature sciences, these very rigorous communal processes for, for knowledge development and, and formation. So our question is this, the question I want to talk about is, are the uh, deficiencies, the epistemic deficiencies, the rational deficiencies that are frequently manifested within the sphere of religion generally, and often enough within the Christian tradition particularly, um, do, uh, do they give reflective Christians, which would include all of us, anybody at a university or capable of coming to a talk in a university, significant reason to be skeptical about or to significantly lessen our confidence in the content of basic Christian teaching, um, whose source is largely this tradition, this long tradition. Um, is this checkered history powerful evidence that the ongoing Christian community is not a reliable source, unlike um, the material sciences taking place in this building, not a reliable source concerning, in this case, the character and basic purposes vis-a-vis -vis us humans of God? And I want to argue that the answer is no. We can, we can, we can fully appreciate and, and acknowledge the kind of less than epistemically perfect, pure, pristine nature of the way religious thought has developed generally and within the Christian tradition, uh, and still think that doesn't give us automatically reason to sort of be skeptical about the, the, the reliability of that tradition. Um, and so I, I think we can continue to believe that, that the Christian revelation is a viable source for us to glean important theological truths. At a minimum, those truths that constitute the basic deposit of faith that are reflected in our earliest creeds and practices. Um, well, I said I, I'll, answer, uh, I'll argue that the answer to that question is no. More exactly what, what I'm going to do, I mean, this is short talk, right? Here's what I'm going to specifically try to do. Make some observations about scientific communities and the Christian uh, community respectively, kind of comparison of the practices of belief formation and religion within these two very different kinds of communities. Uh, and then I'll, I'll state and reply to three basic reasons that I think some people have stemming from the disanalogies between the, the scientific and Christian community for doubting the basic reliability of the Christian community uh, and, uh, and respond to those objections. Uh, I expect that when we then talk about this together, we'll maybe uncover some other reasons and we'll see where we're at at the end. Um, we're not going to solve all these things, but I want to get this discussion on the table to help us to begin to kind of think about this issue because it's, it's a major source of resistance that many people have, who've, especially those who've not been reared within the Christian tradition, for taking seriously the possibility that Christianity could in fact be a reliable source of knowledge about God and his purposes. Right? They just say, ah, it's just, religion's just bad, bad ways of trying to, to uncover knowledge of the truth. All right, so start with scientific communities of trust. So we're at point section two of your handout. Uh, as science has become hyper-specialized, the distribution of labor among scientists has become correspondingly very fine-grained. In consequence, very little of what an individual scientist believes concerning even her own field of expertise is based on evidence that she herself has acquired firsthand. And even much of what we would loosely call her first-hand acquaintance with evidence is partly theory-mediated, right? If you're a scientist, you know this, right? You, you bring a, a, a theoretical perspective to bear even on your experimental results and you see those results through the lens of that theory, right? And the basis for that theory is other people have, have, have laid the foundation for that. And so, so even your observations are partly based in social trust, the trust that you have that this is a, a useful theoretical lens through which to interpret data. Now, this trust is not uncritical. There are practices of independent experiment, peer review, 
and so on to provide individuals with some good reason for a measured trust in reports that flow to them via these channels. Um, we should observe that large scientific networks do not have a flat structure. There are hierarchies of intellectual authority in the sciences that in best cases serve to more efficiently channel and filter the flood of new data and ideas. There are credentialing authorities, curricular authorities, research funding, right, gatekeepers, uh, reporting authorities, and all of these are alongside kind of informal authorities in the form of highly respected leaders in the field who weigh in on the relative plausibility of new lines of inquiry. This is how science actually proceeds. These authorities are not regarded as infallible, even in the most tightly circumscri circumscribed domains, and so they can be and properly are challenged sometimes. Still, they play an important and in many cases indispensable role in advancing scientific knowledge. I should say, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm by no means critical of uh, the way the sciences proceeds. Um, but, you know, there, there are some cynics sometimes about science. It's worth pointing out, even scientists, who say things don't always go as well as they should, even in the sciences. Sometimes authorities are invested with, you know, they just pronounce on new ideas and, and, and don't allow new ideas to really flourish as, as smoothly as they ought. Uh, so I think it was Max Planck, famous physicist, who said, science proceeds one funeral at a time. <laughs> and what he meant by that was uh, sometimes these people become, they're so invested late in their career, they've made their names, you know, through some theoretical paradigm that they are not, they're resistant to challenges. And in the sciences, because competition for funding is so fierce, that can mean you don't get funding, right? If, if gatekeepers say, this is not worth investing money in since we have so few precious research dollars. So things don't always go smoothly, but I think in the long run, these things work their way out in the sciences by and large. Uh, I'm not skeptical about the ability of science to uncover real knowledge. Um, so uh, this hierarchical structure of authority, though, permits the individual scientist to focus his trust away from the multitude of unknown scientists around the globe of varying ability and even trustworthiness. Some of them are frauds, a few of them, right? But, but the individual scientist can't be bothered with having to think about all that and know who these people are that are doing all similar experiments within his field. Uh, and instead, they just focus their, their trust on a small number of gatekeepers whom they know to be widely trusted and whose activities in these important roles are more carefully scrutinized, right? Uh, so a final historical observation that's relevant for our, our larger purposes, even the best of our sciences have had to mature over long periods of time, and their histories are riddled with false starts, failed projects, and many individual and collective foibles and even occasionally frauds that get uncovered, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I saw a great talk by a, a Christian chemist at MIT um, named Troy, somebody or other, uh, who uh, started off, you know, talking about uh, alchemy and and so forth. And uh, it, well, I can't. Anyway, he he talked he talked about alchemy, and you know, chemistry grows out of alchemy. I, very disreputable, you know, kind of kind of practice, but that's where it got started, right? It, it's it was a while before kind of really rigorous thought in in chemical science really took hold, and, and then just became what we all think of as mature chemistry. Uh, yeah, I'll skip that. Okay, so the Christian community. So that's science. So think about the Christian community and its purported mediation of divine revelation. So unlike the sciences, the ongoing, as I'm sorry, now I'll speak from a Christian point of view, the ongoing spirit-filled and spirit-led life of the Christian community is not wholly dedicated to knowledge generation and transmission. Far from it. That's not what it's all about, just passing along a reliable uh, structure of information. But it is that in part. And it is this that I wish to consider, this aspect of what, what's going on in the life of the Christian community. Communal Christian belief, all right, so now let's look at its history. It did not arise fully formed, but it slowly developed, and it continues uh, uh, to develop in certain ways, from its Jewish roots and the pivotal events surrounding the life of death 
of Jesus of Nazareth in first century Palestine. In the immediate aftermath of Jesus' death and we believe resurrection, there were struggles to come to terms with the meaning and significance of these events and the proper understanding of his teaching. Small splinter movements arose from very early on. Textual scholars see indications of early creeds themselves that were probably rooted in religious liturgies in the writings of Paul, right? Uh, the, the, the famous missionary apostle uh, whose, uh, whose writings constitute the earliest of the New Testament texts. There was a slow, criterially based process of identifying certain texts, certain writings in the aftermath of Jesus' death as authoritative, leading eventually to the formation of a canon. These canonical writings are neither individually nor collectively a fully articulated, you know, what you might say, philosophical system of belief. Right? They're just disparate types of writings that are saying different things and, and trying to do different kinds of things. It's not a kind of abstract treatise. Here is what we believe, right? Uh, all worked out in a kind of careful point by point um, fashion. Debates uh, about the nature of Christ, Christological controversies, were debated and pronounced on in early council based creeds of the church, with some views being de uh, deemed heretical. As the church uh, spread geographically, we can also see sub-traditions such as Celtic Christianity that had distinctive emphasis of teaching and practice. Most noteworthy is the growing apart of the Eastern and Western churches after the fall of Rome, with an eventual sharp and tragic separation early in the second millennium. But there were also ongoing controversies and theological developments within each of the, these two broad communions, East and West. And then, of course, a consequence of the Protestant Reformation was an explosion of diversity of belief and practice. Uh, last I heard, we were 41,000 denominations and counting. <laughs> That's a little bit misleading, of course, because you can group a lot of these within broad families and so forth. But you know, that, that's where we're at. We've got this enormous diversity now in the church. This history makes plain that the proper interpretation of the Christian Bible, viewed as a vehicle of divine revelation, is very difficult when it comes to the details. And educated skepticism about Christian belief often starts right here. We should expect, the skeptic says, that a revelation from God concerning himself and his purposes for human beings would have been fully clear, easily interpreted, and unmarred by ambiguity or false or misleading claims or background assumptions or, or whatever, but we don't see this, right? They, 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 they say, I, th I think this got reference for those of you who were there last night. Um, uh, the, the character of the text, I think um, yeah, my co-presenter, Andy uh, Norman, was wanting, was wanting to say, this, is this the kind of text you would expect uh, to come from an infallible God? And he, he just thought it was just transparently no. Um, well, I spoke a moment ago about uh, ongoing disagreements within the Christian community on points of what we might call pure theology. In addition, science and biblical scholarship has changed how most of, us, most of us think about the doctrine of creation. And human moral and political experience and reflection has affected how we think about a number of interpretive matters on which there has been Christian teaching. The skeptic then invites us to draw a negative conclusion from our failure to see what it is assumed we should see if Christian teaching were basically correct. And that is, we should see, they, the skeptic says, maximal clarity and minimal ambiguity in the content of any real revelation. Well, perhaps many find plausible this conditional, if this is a revelation from God, it should be extremely clear and unambiguous and not be subject to changing interpretation over time. Um, maybe they find this conditional plausible because Christians themselves have sometimes claimed as much for the Bible, right? It is just transparently obvious what the Bible is saying. Uh, and, then the, and then these Christians have drawn harsh moral conclusions at, in times of theological controversy about fellow Christians 
who understand that revelation differently on what are taken to be important points. It must be because of something bad about you morally, that you are inclined to read the Bible differently than I am on this point, right? Uh, but such a strong claim about what a genuine divine revelation should look like is unconvincing as an a priori matter, right? Sorry, that's a bit of philosophical lingo, you know, a priori, prior to, you know, just somehow we're just supposed to see as a matter of pure rational theology, this is how God would choose to reveal himself, right? Um, and we, I, I would say we cannot assume that God would want to make things easy for us. There's an assumption built in there when you, say, when you just assume God would want to make things easy for us. Um, we are entitled to assume, I think, that God would use an effective means to accomplish his purposes in a process of revelation. And a, an infinite, omnipotent being is going to be effective. He's going to ch choose to use an, an effective means to accomplish his purposes. And these purposes will be good purposes. But we should be prepared to be surprised when it comes to the specifics concerning what those purposes are, specifically. And the proper Christian understanding of the nature and interpretation of Christian revelation is itself a theological matter, best settled, like other theological matters, by broad-based reflection. It requires inference, partly from the data of revelation itself, and despite what some Christian traditions suggest, the inference is not a straightforward one. Uh, furthermore, the best account of the nature of the Christian revelation may reasonably change over time as, for example, new information comes to light about the context, the literary genre, and the textual history of certain biblical texts. And as we are able to observe the unfolding history of the church, we, 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 we're in a position to discern uh, things that we might not have, might not have been as clear right, to earlier generations. Uh, fine, finally, since revelation is partly an epistemic concept, we should be open to letting lessons from the epistemology of other domains of human inquiry um, inform how we understand it. That last sentence, I almost didn't read it. I realized it was horribly <laughs> in-house academic jargon. In other words, uh, we, we should learn what, look at what we've learned about um, the knowledge and rationality uh, from other um, domains, especially from science. I think science, I, I'm gonna develop this in just a second now, uh, has taught us how to think about what, rash, what, what rational procedures consist in, right? It's not just, we shouldn't think that, well, it was just obvious back to Aristotle 2400 years ago, same ideas exactly about what rational inquiry looks like as it, as it is today. No, we've actually, our, our understanding of what reasonable processes of interpretation of the natural world or of texts, in the case of the Bible, have, have changed. We learned some new things about how to interpret the nature or, 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 the, or, or literary text, and this informs how we think about revelation. Um, so, all right, this is a bunch of methodological points I was making, so let's consider a few specifics. Our take on Christian revelation and doctrinal change over time should plausibly be rooted in a Christian perspective on God's uh, more general dealings with humanity and with his covenant people in particular. From that Christian perspective, there plainly has been significant diversity of and or evolution in theological belief, going all the way back to base, very basic misunderstandings of supernatural reality and its relationship to natural reality in early human history, right? If we believe God uh, was engaged with early humans prior to even God's self-revelation uh, to the, the ancient Israelites and the founding of ancient Israel, right? The, the early human religious beliefs were there were a lot. There was lots of error, polytheism, you know, animism, these kinds of things. Now that we would say from a mature Christian perspective, these are just these were false beliefs. Um, and even into the early covenantal history with the descendants uh, of Abraham, I think you can discern. This can be kind of shocking to some Christians. We can discern in certain Old Testament texts. Uh, um, intimations that the writers themselves may have thought that there were kind of 
godlike beings below the high god, right? Uh, I don't think the Bible teaches that, but I think, uh, just like I don't think the Bible teaches that we live in a three-storied universe with a kind of a dome stretched out over the sky and the waters above and the waters below, but some of the, the writers of the Bible did think that, and it's intimated in the way they describe creation. You know, but, uh, so just a, a quote from Psalm 97, For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. There's a hymn that many Christians know, a kind of simple hymn that we sing, right? Uh, there's reason to believe that writer really thought there were gods, you know, a multiplicity of gods, and, but, but the Israelite belief is there's a most high God, right? Well, we don't, that, that kind of thinking has kind of dropped out of our, we, we don't describe uh, our theological beliefs in that way. Um, so, you know, the, the, the point is God didn't, correct, give a fully perfect theological understanding. He didn't take care to make sure that all people involved in the process of revelation understood everything and understood everything correctly um, from the very get-go in this unfolding revelation. So the fact that God has apparently not acted to ensure that such basic misunderstanding would not arise is a very significant theological point. Um, though it's, I can't really adequately address it here. Uh, it's related to um, the more general problem of divine hiddenness, the puzzle for those of us who uh, uh, are theists of why God would not make his existence and purposes for human beings in general just more evident to everyone. But two aspects of biblical revelation are relevant. These are two things I would point to from right within the biblical revelation. The first is this consistent emphasis that we so underappreciate in the West, in especially modern Western culture, that God loves humanity and his peace, people as a subset of humanity, not only as a bunch of individuals, but it collectively. Right? There's, there's huge emphasis in the Bible on the people of God as, as, a, as this kind of living, organic thing, right? Um, in such a way that the, the short-term goods for individuals are regularly sacrificed in order to achieve a collective end. That's just the way God operates, He's, right? And that offends our sense of, you know, but you, you know, you, you, you can't, um, you know, I, I have a right to know all that there is to know right now, me and my, my situation. Um, so uh, I, I'm recounting the Old Testament heroes of faith. The author of the New, Tes New Testament epistle to the Hebrews writes, these were all, so he's talking about all these people going all the way back to Noah and Abraham and so forth. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, would they be made perfect, right? Part of what God is ultimately intending for them is not gonna be realized in their lives, their earthly lives. It's only gonna much, many, many uh, generations later only are what, some of what God is intending for them to be manifested. Uh, the second relevant aspect of biblical revelation, of course, is its progressive character within and across the two testaments. More and more God's purposes are, are, are becoming more clear, right? It's being unfolded, it's being revealed in, in, in much greater detail. And the related theme, related to that, and the theme so prominent in the Gospels of reversals of expectations. God regularly is, is willing to act in ways that just surprise his people, that based on what they had, had received up to that point, it's not what they had expect, right? expected. So taken together, these things indicate that God's plan for human beings uh, integrally includes our having incomplete and, it seems, erroneous in some cases, theological beliefs, different ones in different times and places for reasons that are not always revealed, even to later generations. Um, it's, this is not obviously contrary to God's goodness. So if we have independent reason to think the Bible is a plausible candidate for being a vehicle of God's revelation, this particular feature of the process should not be taken as somehow disconfirming. Um, now, the Christian revelation pertaining to Jesus Christ plainly purports to be a pivotal moment in an unevenly progressing understanding. It's not just a smooth, slow, steady. Jesus Christ is this pivotal moment 
for Christians. It is both indispensable and it's foundational to faith, conveying the essential information con concerning God's profound love for human beings, his redemptive purpose and plan, and his own mysteriously triune relational nature. Even so, it is plausible, given all that we know, that it is God's aim that even we who have already received and embraced God's self-revelation in the New Testament should continue to grow in our understanding of it, um, concomitant with our collective intellectual and moral maturation. The opportunity to participate in the discovery of new truth and growth and understanding is, in any domain, a great good. It's a great good for human beings, right? To participate. If you're, those of you who are science students, you want to participate in this process of, and it's not just about, so we can finally just know all, a bunch of things. The participating in that process of uncovering truth is itself a great good, something that humans find great fulfillment in doing. Um, the particular ways that this occurs within the church, though, serve distinctively moral theological goods. It pushes us, Christians, to depend on one another in complex ways and over many generations and across divides of culture, ethnicity, class, and gender. And do it because we have to depend on one another um, for insights because it, we don't have it all fully understood and articulated, it binds us together, making tangible the important theological truth that despite our unfortunate continuing divisions, we are one body, mystically joined to Christ as our head. It is also appropriate to the great value of what we're seeking to know, the living God and the details of how he engages his creation, that we should have to work at it, have to engage in an ongoing collective effort to attain a fuller measure of that knowledge. Well, I could say some more things about uh, how this takes place uh, in, uh, in the church, but you know, we don't, we don't believe, Christians believe that um, God's, uh, we're not expecting new revelations from God, new canonical revelations from God, right? Um, but even so, the ongoing experience over the generations across different cultures over time of the Christian church adds to our theological understanding as different people in different kinds of communities have tried to live out the Christian faith, right, uh, and have, have reflected on that, their voices has contributed to Christian understanding of the, the, a lot of the nuances of how we understand the faith. So we, we have this ongoing um, process, right? Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop, pause there, because I, I want to try to wrap up fairly quickly so we can have some discussion. So now we're on the other side of your handout. Um, major disanalogies between science and the Christian community. The core physical and life sciences in their present day mature form constitute humanity's best traditions of inquiry from a purely rational epistemic point of view. They're the most rigorous, well-cultivated kind of uh, sets of practices. So let's consider the epistemic significance of three points of seemingly sharp disanalogy between them, and, uh, between the, the sciences and the tradition of theological reflection on the Christian revelation. Points that some take to ground pessimism concerning Christianity. All right, so the first one, this is given on your handout. Put it this way, Christian data is comparatively meager and more or less fixed with the result that unlike in the sciences, there's little opportunity for bad theories, think constructive theologies, to, f to fail in the face of cold, hard fact, right? This is often held forth to us. This is a great virtue of the sciences, constantly seeking new data so that even much long-held, cherished theories potentially can get overthrown by newer and better theories. Um, well, all right, so what, what would I say in response to this kind of worry? And so we don't have anything like this, and so that's the problem, right? There's, there's a problem here. We don't, we don't have the opportunity to correct what might be faulty understanding. Well, as noted earlier, we do get significant new religious data in the form of testimony concerning the religious experiences of each new generation. That said, it is true that the most important of our theological data were given long ago. It is true and theologically important 
absent special revelation from God, we would have very little hope, no hope, I would say, for detailed knowledge concerning God and his purposes, to just try to figure it out by some kind of pure rational theology. Um, however, over time, we get better handles on how to systematize the data as a result of new information that comes in from outside the bounds of narrowly religious data. Uh, humanistic, humanity scholarship, science, and even moral, social, and political experiences that feed back into our reflections on the nature and proper organization of the church, how the church ought to relate to societies in which it is embedded, what loving conduct consists in, uh, and even very carefully applied how we understand the love and mercy of God. Um, this input is not wholly external insofar as important criticisms of Christian belief or practice from within, say, Western culture, starting with the Enlightenment, derive to a large degree from Christianity itself. Uh, for example, the deeply Christian idea of the equality of persons, um, right, that gets emphasized uh, in Enlightenment thinking, it's, it had, finds its root, as I emphasized last night, if you were there, it, this is a Christian idea. And so, in effect, sometimes critics Critics are often calling us to a more consistent uh, um, practice uh, of, of, our, of the, own, the values we ourselves already hold. Um, the vision of science that was laid in the 16th and 17th century, right, emerges out of a Christian culture of, uh, of people, you know, it's the study of God's other book, right, that um, Francis Bacon, God wrote two books, right, the, the book of his word and the book of his works, right, many, many, not all of the, the important early scientific figures, but of many of them, many of the most significant ones of them were deeply religious Christians of one stripe or another, and they were persuaded, right, that we should see a rational, intelligible order here because it's the product of an infinitely wise God. And then, so then when certain surprising scientific uh, understandings come to light later on in that process, um, right, uh, and this conflicts with how the church has thought about the natural world in certain respects and our place within it, um, that we should accommodate to that, 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 that the book of nature has things to teach us is, is an old Christian idea. Right? Even though not all Christians were equally comfortable with uh, taking that idea to heart and applying it to the, the new knowledge that was coming in. So this new experiential data, new experiences of every generation, new uh, ongoing reflection, constitutes nothing like, of course, the kind of experimental tests that scientific theories face, but it is significant. Um, and given that the body of theological truth we can reasonably hope to have is much less complex than the content of modern physical theories, our having less data and less exacting methods of testing theological theories or the theological counterpart of theories is not as crippling as it might otherwise be. That's, that's all I'll say about that first objection. Uh, second objection, you Christians have a comparatively lousy team of theorists and experimentalists, right? Uh, the reply here is that scientific communities are elitists, right? And this is part of why they're so good at what they do. They're composed entirely of trained individuals who are allowed to make meaningful contributions to the enterprise only by submitting themselves to a rigorous process of winnowing. Christian communions are, to a large extent, non-elitist in their organization. So run-of-the-mill Christians may not be particularly intellectually adept, and moreover, they, uh, your average Christian maybe values truth in religious beliefs only or largely instrumentally for the way that, they, what they really care about is right love of God, and insofar as right belief is you know, helpful, that's, that's how they care. But they don't want to hear about subtle details of things because it's not really going to help them as they see it cultivate their love of God, which is what they're principally about. Only intellectuals care about, you know, kind of refined theological understanding for its own sake. Um, people of all levels of general education and theological understanding and indeed of moral character are welcomed into the Christian fold under very minimal conditions that have nothing to do with intellectual acuity or, or, in, or, or education or anything like that. While some persons whose theological understanding is fairly shallow are content 
to let those of greater understanding speak concerning the content of the faith to the wider community, uh, a great many others are all too happy to express their own opinions. And those of us, of course, who, who inhabit, uh, as I do, kind of a free church kind of Protestant traditions, we, we know the downside of this kind of populism, right? Um, if you're, you're in a kind of more uh, a, 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 a Christian community that's more hierarchically structured, where there's recognized theological authorities, um, you don't get as many cranks kind of popping off and, <laughs> and kind of purporting to speak. And of course, in the era of the internet, um, they have a, a big platform uh, to use. So this makes for real practical problems with, within Christian churches. Uh, but it does not make for a straightforward argument that anyone who draws on this motley, somewhat egalitarian community will be unable to attain a reasonable measure of knowledge uh, or understanding. It does mean that the person who attempts to evaluate reasonably the competing claims concerning and on behalf of Christianity um, needs to take care to sift through the many voices, the kind of cacophony of people purporting to, to say what Christianity is about. Uh, and to, in order, you have to kind of sift through that in order to hear and consider those that have the greatest likelihood of speaking knowledgeably and wisely. For if you're an intellectual, somebody who's, who's, who's sort of engaged in a university context uh, and have kind of high, a high bar, um, this is going to be a long process and sometimes it involves shifts of opinion over time. Uh, in some cases, doing so well takes courage as coming to question distinctives of one's particular sub-tradition within the broad Christian stream can be no less painful and, and costly than abandoning, abandoning one's own religious identity altogether. Uh, you know, I should say courage is no less, just make this point, uh, courage is no less needed for the non-religious inquirer in coming to embrace Christian faith. Uh, in the contemporary academy that we inhabit, going from unbelief to belief is socially much more difficult than going in the reverse direction. Um, so anyway, we're not the only ones that, that need to show intellectual courage uh, in evaluating honestly evidence. All right, final uh, third, third objection, third worry. By comparison to the mature sciences, the methods of evolving Christian belief seem like a total mess, going nowhere. They're often overseen by those who exercise forms of political power that aren't obviously conducive to truth seeking, right? Why are certain opinions getting a hearing and not others in certain times and places? All right, it's kind of a power dynamic rather than just, you know, let the best ideas emerge, right? Uh, and that'll decide, right? Um, and they're often conducted conducted by people with pet theories or denominational allegiances they're not willing to reconsider and so on. Okay? Well, in reply, who could deny that these things have been and are the case some of the time within, within the broad, long history of Christian uh, theological debate and controversy? Taking a wide-angle lens view of all the major sub-traditional strands of Christianity, it is collectively a bit of a mess. Um, that is, in terms of trying to, you know, it, rather than a kind of slow, steady march towards theological understanding, there's just there's, there's a lot of mess going on, and so, certain whole sub traditions sometimes are just going off the rails in not in ways that are that are um, not well lined up with with even the the, the evidence taken at face value. Um, but similar to what I suggested earlier, I would say that when we reflect on what is going on. By its own lights, the messiness of formal and informal theological uh, discussion that goes on within and among the various Christian sub-traditions should be unsurprising and is not indicative of the church as a whole's failing to track significant truth and indeed even to grow slowly in its understanding of that truth over time. Um, first, we should ask ourselves why suppose that God would take care to ensure that the community of those of us to whom he has given uh, the gift of faith, why, why should we, why, that, that it would have a theology that is at the level of details relatively unchanging or unfolds in a nice, orderly, consensus-driven way. It has been the apologetic of some ardent supporters of very stringent 
or authoritarian Christian traditions, that that is precisely what we should assume since the alternative is complete skeptic, skepticism. You'll often hear this if you ask a Christian, why think that, they, you know, that, that necessarily things had to have gone exactly in this very nice, neat, tidy way? Well, otherwise, then it, we could, we'd have to be totally skeptical about what God's up to. Um, it's kind of amusing to me, 400 years later, to think that uh, Christ, Catholic and Protestant theologians said of each other's hermeneutical position in the aftermath of the Reformation precisely that if, if, if your basic kind of approach to Christian revelation is right, the only result we could have would be total skepticism about what God is saying. They both said, they, they said completely parallel things about, about either side, right? Um, uh, I don't have time to develop that. Sorry, I, I need to wrap up here. Um, you know, but here's the thing I would say. The one thing we've most definitely learned from the history of philosophy and science, more so, um, is that foolproof certainty outside the realm, say, of pure and elementary mathematics is just a chimera, right? We just don't get that. Science is not after foolproof certainty about anything, right? As is the hope of nice, steady, always growth in knowledge free of missteps, right? Uh, and science is full of, you know, blind alleys and, and a whole, you know, trains of thought that went on for decades that people later just abandoned and said, no, we've got to start, start all over again. Um, indeed, it's the claim to certain knowledge that looks inherently implausible from our present standpoint. Uh, in the, because we ought to we, uh, factor this kind of general lesson about human fallibility into our understanding about how human beings, how the people of God, receive and handle God's revelation. Um, you know, uh, so I'll just close with this. Look, in other, we see in other contexts, and even in our best um, practices of theological, uh, of, of inquiry, the sciences, when we look at the messy process, the way this has unfolded, we see that it is possible for human beings nevertheless to make progress through partly man-made clouds of dust over time. Uh, and so perhaps we can manage all right uh, as, as Christians in trying to do something similar with respect to uh, what God has vouchsafed to us in his divine revelation. All right, well, thank you for your patience and see what time we have. Please. You spoke very generally about the nature of hmm. sort of theories. And Get more pizza, by the way, for those of you who don't, please don't uh, worry about it. Oh, yeah, go you. ahead. Um, you spoke very generally about the nature of truth seeking and sort of an evolving theology since yeah. Christ. Um, so I sort of have two questions. What's a more specific example of this kind of progress that you're talking about? Yeah. And how would you respond to someone who says, well, the Bible is all the theology we need. Why should we seek to change it? Yeah. Um, well, so, so I mean, I, 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 I write, I'm, I'm a creedal Christian. I believe the Christian creeds, right? Uh, and I sort of inhabit a, a kind of, you know, broadly theologically uh, traditionalist, conservative Protestant theology. Um, just so, so you can, so what I mean by evolving, it's not some kind of, you know, things are radically shifting over time perspective. But think about the way, the easy, the easy example is the way we think about the nature of God's wider creation, the cosmos, right? Um, you know, uh, at the time of Galileo, right, uh, there, there, and there are all kinds of texts I could, you know, show you in the Bible uh, that, that theologians, smart, smart, learned theologians pointed to and say, look, it says the earth doesn't move. Right? So the earth can't be revolving around the sun. Um, and, uh, and what people didn't even fully appreciate, there are even texts that indicate, as I said, this kind of three-storied universe. Though the, There's language. You go right back to the book of Genesis. You know, God opened the floodgates, the flood of Noah, right? And the water came, and there's all this language about the waters underneath. You know, and to us, we kind of read that. We kind of say, oh, vaguely poetical language or something like that. No, we know, scholars know from outside, the study of the Bible, that the ancient Near Eastern world in which these texts arose, right, they had a cosmology on which there's the earth, it's flat, 
It's either it's some some it's either a disk or it's a square. One you know little variation uh, in that there are waters underneath, right? Uh, physically underneath the earth um, and uh, spring up in various places. And there's a dome. The sky is a hard shell. Stars are fixed in it, right? And but there are little windows, the floodgates, and that's how rain comes because they. Periodically, these things open up, and, and because there's, it's just full of water up above, and so and when you open the wind, okay, we know this was a view that, that was the cosmology of, of that time, and so some of the ancient biblical writers um, kind of indicate they believe that. Now, so the question is, is God, through his revelation, teaching us that this is what's true? Right? Is this, do we have scientific confirmation that the Bible is saying false things? I would say no. I would say, we would say, uh, but we, we have to get theologically sophisticated in how we understand what does this mean to say this is God's revelation. God's indeed infallible revelation properly understood. God doesn't teach us errors deliberately, but he's not taken care to supernaturally um, correct errors of scientific thinking in the minds of the biblical writers through whom he is wishing to communicate truths. Right? But we say, theologically, God's not trying to teach us science there, or the structure of, he's, he's teaching deep theological truths, right? And, but he's, you know, inhab the, the human author has this kind of mistaken cosmology, and it's, it's, it's sort of reflected right there in the text, okay? And then later with the Earth Doesn't Move and Galileo, um, in which, by the way, you know, the fact that that became such a theological controversy, um, you know, everything people think they know about Galileo and what happened, there's, it's just a huge mythology built up about that. Um, I'll just say that. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the, the Reformation. That came a century after the Reformation. And because this fierce theological controversy between the Reformed theologians and Catholic theologians um, uh, over who's right uh, on certain theological points, uh, led them to pay very close attention to theological texts and it led to a, a kind of increasing literalism on the Catholic side. We don't usually associate Catholic theology with a kind of un excessive literalism, but at the time of the Reformation, this was a kind of consequence uh, of this reformational, con that, that, that for a period of time, that, you know, so they were saying, no, it says the earth does not move, right? Now, they were willing to consider that might be, we could be wrong about that, but uh, that has to be our default assumption. Well, now we no longer read texts that way. And it's partly through scientific knowledge, but not just that, it's partly through scholars opening up some things to us and, and helping sensitize us to genre and background assumptions that were going on in the minds of people who were writing texts at different times and places. So that would be, sorry, I gave such a typical professor long-winded answer to your question. Um, that would be an example, and the, the, the people who say we only need the Bible for theology, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not looking to bring, and we ought not to, it's never been, the Christian tradition has emphatically said, we don't look to bring fundamental theological understanding from outside the Bible into, that we somehow get from elsewhere, right? But what we do bring in from the outside are tools that equip us to better handle this collection of highly disparate texts written over a long, long stretch of time collectively, from the oldest Old Testament text to the latest New Testament text, right? That's not easy. And sometimes Christians, you know, even within my own Christian, this kind of free church Protestant sort of thing, that there's this lingo of, um, you know, I just read the Bible, right, kind of thing. And they don't realize they're being taught to read the Bible in a very specific kind of way. There is this tradition of Protestant interpretation of the Bible of a certain kind. It is a tradition, but they haven't been taught it as a tradition. They don't realize that when they were you know, taught to read various texts, it's being expounded to them, either just in the pulpit or in Bible studies in this sort of way. They're being taught to systematically see the Bible in certain kinds of ways and to emphasize certain things and de-emphasize others. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, it's, I, I would say it's inevitably we do through, through some theological lens or other. The, the problem is they, the, the, these kinds of very recent sub-traditions sort of want to abandon the whole history of what the church has thought and understood for centuries and, thought, and wrestled really hard, very devout people who knew the Bible inside out, right? Um, but who didn't read it exactly the same as these other traditions. So. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, understanding an old text is not something that's trivial. And it's, it's the same kind of, it, there's a certain arrogance sometimes to think it is. It's kind of like a cultural arrogance we can have when we go into an outside culture and we think we know what's going on just you know, with very little familiarity. Um, we have to learn to be patient. Right? We have to allow people who better understand the culture of these texts and, and uh, Christians from different traditions speak to us concerning how they've understood it and realize this complex dialogue going on here within the church over a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, well, the data we have, I mean, just viewed internally, right? It's like taking seriously the, the Christian hypothesis, this is a revelation from God, okay? So here, here's your text, and you say, okay, I'm trying to understand what, what would it be then to understand what's being communicated through this thing, since it was written by human authors, but somehow inspired by God um, to be a vehicle of revelation. Um, and so we, we say God has ch chosen, chosen to speak often through poetry as well as through more direct kind of forms of kind of theological statements. Um, and uh, that's what we have. And the data is very qualitative. It's uh, in character, right? It's just broad, broad brush strokes, uh, um, expressions about God's purposes, and so on. Um, and well, that, that tells us that you know, the kind of information that we can get out of this process is going to be at a kind of high level of generality. And so it's, it's okay if, you know, the, this pre the precision of data that you get in the sciences allows you to give uh, a great deal more precision, develop pre precise theories about mechanisms uh, at play in the physical world, right? Um, Christian theology is not like that. It doesn't, I mean, uh, compared to, say, physics, in a certain formal respect, Christian theology has nothing like that level of precision. It's not a highly mathematized, you know, detailed, you know, ar architectonic of physical structures at different levels of granularity. It's nothing like that. It's, it's about, look, this uh, amazing, infinite, eternal being has uh, brought forth the physical cosmos and he cares for human beings. He declares us to be his image bearers. He has redemptive purposes for us. He's bringing these about through, the, through uh, Jesus. You know, the doctrine of the nature of Jesus and, and this Trinitarian doctrine that's implicit in the New Testament, that's as highly sophisticated maybe as it gets with, when it comes to Christian theology. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, you might, I mean, maybe, you know, you say the, the ability, you know, there were a lot of controversies in the early church about how to go, how exactly to understand Trinitarian theology or Jesus' nature. Um, you might think that, well, um, since the data was fairly impressionistic, uh, I can have more confidence in a broad strokes understanding of Trinitarian theology than I can of this or that very particular way of, of you know, articulating it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then, so, so there's, a, there's a humility. We, we do have a lack of precision of data, and that should have, well, I, I, you know, we have a hierarchy of confidence in our views, appropriately, in any, in any domain, right? Very general level truths, we can have much more confidence once we've decided this is God's revelation. It's much easier to discern. Finer grain truths, exactly how this works out, right? Um, exactly who gets saved and how, under what circumstances, what do we say about people who live outside the, 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 the sphere of the Christian revelation. These are, you know, there have been different views within the Christian tradition in part because it's ambiguous, right? And we, and we don't have the ability to, to now try to do further tests to try to figure it out. That's the level of detail that God has allowed us to have. And so we, I don't know if I, fully adequately answered your question, but I, I think we, we, uh, 
there, there is the inability to, to um, put certain questions that we have to the test. And so I think we just have to say, okay, maybe we can have thoughts about that. What seems plausible given what we do know, we can't really be sure. Because as we know from science, often plausible implications of, view, of theories aren't always actually true, right? The fact that it kind of seems to fit with, uh, it, it could turn out to be false, but we don't have, like we have in the method of sciences, say, well, are those plausible ideas actually the case? So we ought to have humility. <laughs>